On the 2nd of June 2005, I was having some friends over to celebrate my 14th birthday. Within a couple of hours, we were told that something happened. So we turned on the television, as one would, and we discovered that someone was assassinated. This was a bit of a shock because at the time we, ha we were just recovering as a country from a major assassination, that of then Prime Minister Rafik Hariri. His assassination led to what we now call the Cedar Revolution, which itself ousted the Syrian army and thus ended the Syrian occupation of Lebanon. But that particular assassination, the one on June 2nd, marked me in a different way. On that day, the journalist Samir Asir was killed. He was assassinated with a car bomb. I, like many others of my generation, did not fully understand back then the significance of what was happening. I keep on going back to June 2nd and the assassination of Samir Asir. Samir was not just an excellent Lebanese writer, historian and journalist, but he was also someone of multiple identities. He was not just Lebanese, but Palestinian and Syrian, as well as a French citizen. He was able to navigate those identities in a way that I think symbolizes the best of that time. When he was killed, an assassination which was followed by the assassination of George Howey just a few weeks later, Howey being the former secretary of the Lebanese Communist Party. When these two men were killed, it felt maybe later on that nothing would ever be the same anymore. So to commemorate the date of his assassination, I sat down with Ziad Majid, a friend of Samir, to talk about the leftist movement that they were trying to build, about their opposition to the Assad regime's occupation, and about what it meant for Ziad to see his close friends pay the ultimate price for their principal positions. So that's it from me. Uh, thank you for sticking around, and I hope you enjoy it. As usual, you can follow the podcast on Twitter at FireTheseTimes. And if you like what I do, please consider supporting this project with only $1 a month on Patreon or buymecoffee.com. And you can also do so directly on PayPal if you prefer. Patreon is for monthly, PayPal is for one-offs, and Buy Me a Coffee has both options. And if you cannot donate, you can still help by reviewing this podcast on Apple Podcasts or wherever you get your podcasts. Thank you for your time. <laughs> Ziad Majid, Associate Professor at the American University of uh, Paris and Coordinator of the Middle Eastern Studies Program, author of uh, two books on Syria and one book on Lebanon. So this episode will be released uh, tomorrow, the 2nd of June, which will be exactly 15 years since uh, to the day since Samir Asir was assassinated. Can you talk, can you give a bit of context about the assassination for those who don't know, first of all, and then if you can also give a wider context about the party that you were both part of, your respected roles, and what your positions were? Sure. Um, I met Samir uh, Asir in Beirut in uh, 1994. Uh, at the time, he uh, was settling down in the city after spending many years in Paris, where he did his PhD in history, and he wrote on the Lebanese Civil War, especially uh, the first part of the war, uh, the one uh, from 1975 until 1982, the Israeli invasion of Lebanon. He returned to Lebanon after that. He started teaching at uh, the University Saint Joseph, uh, and he uh, started writing uh, in An Nahar, uh, the Lebanese newspaper, where he had uh, a weekly column uh, evoking issues related to Lebanon, Syria, Palestine, uh, international affairs, etc. Uh, and he was um, ambitious uh, in a in a sense that he wanted to create as well uh, a review, a cultural review, that will be in French. Uh, but will uh, show that uh, you can write in French while being leftist, that you can write in French while, while being concerned with uh, Arabity, with an Arab Renaissance project, uh, with causes that usually uh, the French-speaking newspapers or uh, historically francophone people in Lebanon were not always uh, writing about or dealing with uh, in French. There was a connotation for uh, the French-speaking journalists or intellectuals, whether it was uh, true or wrong, but it was there, uh, that they were much more into Lebanese uh, identity, uh, into uh, centrist or right-wing uh, ideas, etc. So his ambition was to write in French, 
while thinking as a leftist and as someone uh, who has always been uh, involved uh, politically and intellectually for the Palestinian cause, because while in Paris he used to write in Yawm al sabah which was uh, uh, a newspaper related to the uh, uh, PLO. Uh, he was also uh, very much uh, active in the uh, Journal for Palestine Studies in French as well. Uh, and he used to write in Le Monde and Le Monde Diplomatique, mainly about Palestine and the Palestinian cause. Uh, so he was preparing for that uh, uh, review to start. And in fact, he started it in 1995. It was called L'Orient Express. And it left for three years. Uh, it was one probably of the best experiences in publishing in French in Lebanon, uh, cultural and political articles and papers on, on different issues. Uh, then uh, Samir uh, uh, was also, uh, as most Lebanese at the time, um, involved in dynamics and initiatives related to the uh, Lebanese civil society, to the roles of intellectuals, uh, when it comes to, at the same time, confronting corruption and uh, the political elite Uh, Lebanese political elite, uh, business as usual uh, in power, but also concerned with public and private freedoms in front of the Syrian regime hege hegemony and the security service apparatus and their way of uh, uh, controlling and uh, manipulating uh, the, 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 the different scenes in, in Lebanon. So as of 1998, we got involved in uh, many political initiatives. Most of them did not succeed in creating a party. Uh, but the idea of having a political party that could at the same time incarnate a certain left in Lebanon, uh, left in the sense that uh, social justice, uh, that uh, financial and economic reforms, uh, that a secular project uh, with that uh, socioeconomic project and a political one uh, connecting uh, Lebanon uh, to Syria, to Palestine and to the Arab world in general uh, in terms of uh, freedom uh, and in terms of uh, liberation and not disconnecting them as Uh, it has been uh, in many leftist circles the tradition of considering the liberation and the anti-Israeli, anti-imperialist uh, stances as the priority while uh, freedoms, uh, public and private freedoms and the confrontation with Arab regimes was not at all a priority if we don't want to talk about complicity in some cases with the Syrian regime specifically. So we wanted to, uh, to try a political uh, experience or to see if we can and found a party that could reconcile our leftist identity with democratic practices, uh, with an understanding of uh, the struggle for freedom in Syria and for liberation in Palestine, and connect connecting all that to the Lebanese context and to what we were going through in Lebanon. And the uh, attempt at creating such a party will continue in 2000 and then in 2002, but we uh, were never able to, uh, to have this as a concrete project with concrete people and to enlarge at least the small circle in which we were all, with Elias Khoury and with others. And finally, in 2004, we uh, succeeded in founding the Democratic Left Movement. Uh, that was composed of people, uh, most of them, or uh, let's say more than half of them, uh, coming from the Lebanese Communist Party, They left the party either because they had uh, some disputes about the organizational structure and their freedom within the party, or because of the position when it comes to the Syrian regime. They wanted a clear stance uh, about the Syrian regime, while the party at the time was not involved in any opposition uh, to the Syrian regime. So that was one uh, component of the democratic left movement. Another one was made of students. Uh, many of the independent uh, students' organizations in universities uh, were part of the uh, experience at the beginning. Some of them, unfortunately, uh, left later for different reasons, but many stayed. And a third component was much more uh, individuals and smaller groups, either coming from or action or, or the communist action organization, Munazam et Amal Shuai, or uh, from uh, different civil society uh, movements, or just individuals who defined themselves as leftists. And what was common between us was uh, a will, or a desire at least, to have uh, a new movement, a new party that would accept 
inside a proportional representation of its different components that we can be Marxist or non-Marxist, but leftist. Uh, we can uh, be young, uh, old, uh, feminist, uh, concerned with the environment. Uh, uh, we're coming from different backgrounds. And the idea was to, to have an experience where all those backgrounds would be part of the political laboratory and would express themselves uh, differently with, of course, a priority that is to confront the Syrian regime. Uh, Samir was one of the spokesmen of the movement. I was the vice president of that movement as well. Uh, Elias Khouri was with us as a member of the uh, uh, political bureau and Elias Atallah was the secretary general. Um, Nadim Abdul Samad was the president and Hikmat Laid, the other uh, vice president, uh, plus other people like Ziad Saab. Um, and uh, we, I think in 2004 and in 2005, we managed to attract different groups in different regions. Uh, and then with the assassination of Hariri and with the establishment of a large political camp in Lebanon against the Syrian regime that we were part of, we lost some support among some leftist groups because they uh, accused us of cooperating with part of the corrupt uh, political elite of the country that turned against the Syrian uh, regime after the assassination of Hariri. And we, at the same time, attracted other groups who were very much concerned by the fight against the Syrian regime and who considered that finally they can find a leftist group involved in that fight. Now, if you allow me just to say a few words about that specific moment, because I think uh, we, we did not uh, at the time uh, take some time to uh, clarify how we went into an alliance with groups with whom we share very few things uh, when it comes to the social justice, to uh, the secular system, uh, to the equality between man and woman, uh, to ending with uh, corrupt practices, etc. What we said at the time is that we have no illusion that this will be a temporary alliance. We have no illusion that most of our allies were before and probably will continue after a possible withdrawal of the Syrian regime. Uh, they were and they might continue as uh, corrupt elites or as elites involved in all kinds of confessional sectarian politics, we did not have an illusion about it. We thought that there are some other among the allies who might be interested, like us, in a project of uh, reconstructing the state uh, in the country, of having a new uh, political contract, maybe a new social contract. And there were some secular groups and uh, non-corrupt groups within that 14 March alliance. Uh, and we wanted just to end with the Syrian hegemony so that we can go into a, a different approach related to alliances and to the Lebanese uh, politics. Now, ma some people might not approve that, which is also uh, very legitimate, but that was our uh, point of view of the time. And we couldn't afford the... Uh, uh, the possibility of being on our own opposed to the Syrian regime and not connected to any large group in the country. So we consider this as a kind of an historical opportunity in which we can get, can get rid of the Syrian regime in Lebanon and that will weaken it in Syria itself, allowing Democrats and people who uh, resemble us in Syria to uh, start their own uh, experience as well, maybe, and to, to try to benefit or uh, to seek uh, a, a project that would build on what we have uh, done or started to do in Lebanon. Except that while we were still in the momentum that just followed the withdrawal of the Syrian regime in April 26, uh, 2005, the, uh, the fact that uh, parliamentary elections uh, were uh, to be organized in late May and the fact that uh, we thought that having for the first time uh, a deputy coming from the uh, an organized movement of the left, because in the past in Lebanon there were leftists in the parliament, like Habib Sadeh, uh, but uh, never a candidate of the Communist Party, for instance, made it because of different reasons, and no other leftists were able to reach the parliament. So having a deputy there, trying to show through that deputy that we can uh, uh, do uh, politics differently, that we can present uh, legislations, at least projects for legislations, even if they fail in the votes, but at least to say that we can do something different, that uh, a parliamentarian is not to be uh, uh, just someone dealing with his uh, uh, clientelist network, that he can be honest and uh, uh, someone who will show uh, that there are possibilities of uh, uh, being officially a politician without being part of the uh, system itself. In the middle of all that, and in June 2nd, 
just before the uh, elections in uh, Mount Lebanon and then in the north, it was after the elections in Beirut, in fact, Samir uh, got assassinated. And uh, two weeks after or uh, three weeks after his assassination, uh, George Howey, the former secretary general of the Communist Party, with whom we started to uh, coordinate and to cooperate uh, in uh, the ambition of uh, with the ambition of having a larger uh, leftist camp was also assassinated and both of them in my opinion and with many proofs in fact uh, were assassinated by the Syrian regime and its Lebanese allies uh, because they were considered as uh, two pillars in such a leftist project that could have uh, an influence in Syria itself among many uh, young people and, and leftist people. And uh, many of us uh, were put under uh, security pressure and we had to go underground and we were at the same time criticized by many groups uh, and uh, assassinations continued in Lebanon and many of us uh, uh, had to leave the country. Uh, I left for Paris uh, six months after that. Um, Elias Khoury stayed in Lebanon but he went teaching in the US and then returned. Elias Atalla went underground and became a deputy in the in the party. But when he became a deputy, uh, we started diverging, in fact, politically with him. Uh, when I'm saying uh, we, I mean myself, many of the young comrades, uh, Elias Khoury and others, uh, because we thought that he was not uh, uh, doing, let's say, what we hoped he, he would have uh, been able to, to, uh, to do. So uh, many internal uh, disputes started to appear. And then uh, many episodes related to the Lebanese politics and then related to the July war in 2006 uh, led to a split in the movement and then led to a ki kind of clinical death of the movement as of 2007, 2008. And since that time, unfortunately, this experience um, ended in the way at least we, we were hoping it will uh, evolve. So Samir was assassinated on June 2nd, 15 years ago, and he incarnated uh, this kind of reconciliation between the fact that he was born into a Christian family where his father is Palestinian and his mother is Syrian, and he is himself a Lebanese from Ashrafiyya in Beirut. Uh, in the civil war, at least in the first years of the civil war, while living in Ashrafiyya, he was uh, politically uh, much more influenced by the discourse of the Lebanese left in the other part of uh, other part of the city in western beirut and then in in paris he discovered uh, uh, friendships and he built friendships with Syrian uh, dissidents, intellectuals living in Paris like Farouk Mardambek. He started his uh, uh, friendships with Palestinian intellectuals, Eli Sambar and others. And he discovered his Arab identity uh, here in Paris. And that's why when he returned to Lebanon, he was very much concerned with translating all that, all that into uh, two concrete uh, cultural and political projects. And I believe that this was mainly the reason why he was assassinated, because he incarnated all what the Syrian regime uh, hated the most, uh, being uh, uh, pro-Palestinian, pro-democracy, reconciled with the Western culture without approving uh, Western uh, policies and approaches uh, when it comes to the Middle East and to, to other places, and uh, being at the same time attached to uh, secularism and social justice. To understand the, the, the context of Samir's assassination and then, as you said, also George Howe's assassination, can you sort of paint a picture for those who don't know of what Lebanon was like under the Syrian regime's hegemony? So like from the initial invasion in 76 during the war until its withdrawal in 2005? Yes, um, the Syrian regime invaded Lebanon in 1976, uh, and the pretext was to stop the uh, the war, the Lebanese civil war, and uh, to impose a ceasefire following an Arab summit uh, meeting, and also uh, following, and this is no secret, negotiations between Hafez al-Assad, the father of Bashar, and Henry Kissinger, the uh, Secretary of State of the U.S. at the time, who also got the approval of Israel for that withdraw for for the invasion with one Israeli condition, or in fact two Israeli conditions, one uh, not to use the uh, Syrian air force, and the second not to deploy uh, to the south of the Uwali River, which is the river uh, in, in South Lebanon uh, that crosses the city of Saida uh, at the entrance of South Lebanon. And the Syrian regime did respect those two Israeli conditions, invaded the country, uh, defeated the PLO, uh, the Palestine Liberation Organization, and the Lebanese left, 
contrary to what it was uh, saying uh, about intervening to save the Palestinians and to protect Lebanon, etc., it defeated the Lebanese left uh, allied with the PLO. And then uh, it's not a secret neither. It assassinated uh, Kamal Jumblat, who was the head of the Socialist Party and the leader of the Lebanese left at the time, and controlled Lebanon or parts of Lebanon after that uh, with shifting alliances and with playing one group against the other in order to keep justifying its occupation of the country. And then when the war ended in 1990 uh, and uh, Syria or or the Syrian regime got an international recognition of its role in Lebanon as a sponsor of the post-war era, uh, that coincided with the Gulf War the Desert Storm Operation, the American attack on Iraq after Iraq invaded Kuwait, in which the Syrian army was sent under the American flag uh, to fight the uh, Iraqi Ba'athist rival, uh, along with the Egyptian army as well. And in return, uh, Syria got the approval of Saudi Arabia and of the United States to manage Lebanon in the post-war. The uh, agreement between Saudi Arabia and Syria that the Americans approved was to have Rafiq al-Hariri, who is a Lebanese billionaire, a businessman uh, working in Saudi Arabia, and he was a mediator in the Ta'if Accord that puts the end of the Lebanese civil war and uh, brought some reforms. Some of them were implemented and the majority were not. Uh, that Hariri will be in charge of the reconstruction, while Syria will keep managing uh, the foreign policy and the political scene in Lebanon. This was also the time of uh, Arab Israeli negotiations, Madrid process. Uh, Syria and Lebanon had uh, a common delegation led by the Syrian Foreign Affairs Mus- Minister Farouk al So Syria managed politically while Hariri was uh, a kind of uh, a bridge or a connection with uh, his friends in the West, Chirac, Blair, uh, Bush and uh, later Clinton, uh, and he was in charge of the reconstruction in Lebanon. The reconstruction, of course, was controversial. Uh, Many people criticized it because they considered that it was not taking into consideration uh, the social tissue of Beirut, uh, the social fabric. Uh, It was uh, uh, aiming at designing a city or a downtown that will exclude part of its uh, population and uh, part of the uh, middle and popular classes, and to make it an area of investment and of uh, deluxe uh, uh, shops and of uh, foreign tourism. So there were lots of uh, critiques for for Hariri and his reconstruction plan, uh, plus uh, the fact that it was not uh, a balanced uh, reconstruction in different areas. Most of the reconstruction was in Beirut, uh, plus that he didn't take into consideration the size of the Lebanese economy. So uh, there will be lots of debts and there will be a policy to uh, keep the currency stable, whatever would that cost. Uh, uh, There will be lots of uh, controversies about the reconstruction plan, but that plan anyway uh, took off and Hariri uh, was accused by many of his opponents of uh, uh, bribing or sometimes uh, buying uh, politicians, uh, while the corruption of course existed before him and continued uh, through his reign uh, from 92 until uh, on and off until uh, uh, his assassination. He was excluded from power for two years between 98 and uh, 2000. Uh, meanwhile, the Syrian regime kept controlling the political scene. Uh, demonstrations, sit-ins, creation of new political parties were banned in Lebanon, were not allowed. Even the uh, what usually used to manage the civil society in terms of what we call the 1905 association law, which is an Ottoman law uh, where you can create your own organization and you don't need an approval. You just inform the authorities that you have created your own organization. Even Even that as a law was violated and everything needed an approval by the uh, uh, Ministry of of, of Interior that was directly connected to the Syrian regime. And there were in Lebanon Syrian officers who were in charge of managing the uh, uh, political questions, of connecting people, manipulating others. There were censorship on on the press and many journalists used to uh, self-censor themselves as well to avoid uh, problems. Some leaders of the uh, Christian right-wing parties were in jail, others were in exile. So there was uh, a serious political problem in the country. And that problem got worse after 1998, because in 1998, uh, to prepare Bashar al-Assad for succession in Syria, when Hafez was getting uh, sick and tired, uh, Bashar uh, had 
uh, in charge the management of the Lebanese political scene. Uh, and uh, he wanted to weaken Hariri and Jumblat and other heavyweights in the Lebanese scene and to bring his own people, what he called his own generation of politicians, to replace them. So Emil Lahoud, uh, who was the head of the Lebanese army, was elected president, while uh, constitutionally uh, this was uh, a violation of the uh, of the constitution because uh, Lahoud was the head of the army. He should have resigned at least six months before the elections. This didn't happen, so they uh, did an amendment. They modified uh, a clause in the constitution allowing him to become president. And uh, under Lahoud, uh, the uh, security general uh, director, Jamil Sayed, became the strong man of the country. Uh, he was into uh, controlling uh, public freedoms into interfering in uh, uh, newspapers affairs uh, and he he had a very conflictual relation with uh, Samir uh, because he criticized him on many occasions he even confiscated uh, Samir's passport uh, at the Beirut airport and this is the moment where uh, in Lebanon also there were more and more articles about Syria itself and then in 2000 Assad uh, father died Bashar became president uh, Syria witnessed uh, what was called at the time the Damascus Dabas- Damascus Spring uh, from uh, uh, September 2000 until February 2001. And in Lebanon, there were many articles in An Nahar and in the cultural supplement of An Nahar that Elias Khoury was uh, uh, editing. Lots of articles by Syrian intellectuals and by Lebanese intellectuals supporting them in their attempts at ending with the uh, state of emergency. Uh, they demanded the liberation of political uh, prisoners, the return of those who were uh, in exile. And this is a period where uh, at the same time, George Howey was leaving the Communist Party uh, and becoming critical of the leadership of the party. Then things developed. Hariri returned as a prime minister. Uh, he was accused in 2003 and 2004 to uh, cooperate or coordinate uh, with the Lebanese uh, Christian opposition that was formed around uh, Qurna Chihuan, around the Maronite Patriarch. And what uh, did change or modify the uh, political situation was the liberation of South Lebanon from the Israeli occupation because Lebanon was not only invaded by the Syrian regime, it was invaded twice by Israel in 1975 and then in 1982 where the Israeli forces uh, reached Beirut and destroyed part of Beirut and that uh, Israeli invasion killed uh, 34,000 Lebanese and Palestinian civilians in addition to the uh, occupation of large part of the country until Israel started to withdraw gradually following uh, military operation, military resistance that was at the time launched by the Communist Party and leftist groups before Hezbollah uh, that was born in 1983 will start uh, imposing itself on the resistance scene uh, as of 1987-88 and then after the end of the civil war because Israel continued to occupy Lebanon until 2000. And uh, the Communist Party was excluded from the resistance after the end of the war. Uh, that was due to a series of assassinations that targeted its intellectuals and many of its uh, uh, leaders. And it was also because the Syrian regime wanted to control the military resistance and to have it uh, the monopole of Hezbollah, allowing Syria and Iran to decide on the momentum of the uh, resistance and uh, the the moment where its military acts could take place and when uh, this was not uh, beneficial for what Syria considered to be uh, the negotiations with the Israelis that were taking place. So within that uh, ta- context and after the withdrawal of Israel, the opposition against the Syrian regime took a new momentum. It was easy now uh, to, to uh, directly discredit the Syrian argument and discourse uh, justifying its occupation of Lebanon uh, with by by saying that Israel also occupies the country, so our presence here depends on the Israeli occupation. That uh, allowed the uh, opposition to grow against the Syrian regime and uh, to develop until 2005. And later, uh, the assassination of Samir and George uh, was not a coincidence. They targeted at the beginning the leftists who played a role uh, against them directly or indirectly. The last one is very important because it, it's very important to understand that after Hariri's assassination, the first two people who were killed were Samir yes. Asir and Josh Howey. Absolutely. Can you talk a bit about, well, can you expand a bit on the, the communist intellectuals, especially uh, majority people who were from the South who were also assassinated during the war? 
the assassinations of uh, uh, many of the Marxist uh, and communist intellectuals uh, started uh, between um, 86, in fact, it started in 86 and will continue uh, throughout the 80s until uh, uh, 88 and there will be other uh, also incidents uh, at the end of the war. At the time, the context was a context of uh, the rise of Hezbollah. Hezbollah wanted to impose itself on the Shia scene. Uh, that will lead first to clashes between the communists and Hezbollah, and later between Amal movement and Hezbollah. Uh, to talk briefly about uh, uh, that era is, uh, is also to say that most of the communists who were assassinated were Shia themselves or were from Shia families. Uh, Hussein Mruwe, Marxist philosopher who was in his 80s and was killed in his bed. He was not even able to move when the killer uh, entered his apartment and assassinated him. Mehdi Amel, Hassan Hamdan, he used to write under Mehdi Amel, was assassinated in uh, May 18, uh, 1987 in Beirut, close to his house, after being uh, underground for some time following the assassination of uh, Hussein Mruwe. Uh, there were also uh, other uh, younger uh, intellectuals and activists who were assassinated in the southern suburb of Beirut and in the south. And there were people like Suhail Tawili, who was not uh, from a Shia family, who was, who was leading a Tariq magazine that was the magazine of the Communist Party. He was assassinated at home uh, after being kidnapped uh, in, in Beirut as well. Uh, there would be Khalil Naous and others. So at the time, the Communist Party used to talk about obscurantist forces behind uh, the assassinations. Um, hence, he, he was uh, uh, talking about indirectly Hezbollah as being uh, behind the assassinations. And there will be many clashes between the Communist Party and Hezbollah and between a group that will later defect from Hezbollah and create its own movement. Uh, and uh, most of the assassinations uh, took place while Hezbollah was rising and imposing itself when it comes to the military resistance or when it comes to the control of the uh, the, the Shia uh, regions, let's say, geographically speaking, uh, in the 80s. Then uh, Iran and Syria were also competing, even if they were allies, but they were rivals when it, come, when it comes to who controls the, the uh, Shia of Lebanon. So Amal and Hezbollah was the second episode of that uh, uh, internal fight between the Shia, uh, um, exactly at the time where also among the Christians, On and Jaja were fighting each other, Amal and Hezbollah as well. And while Syria wanted Amal to be the uh, most important and central representatives of the Shia, Iran was pushing for Hezbollah. And finally, in 1991, they agreed uh, to uh, share or to have a power sharing formula in which the Amal movement will be feeding the state institutions uh, in the sense that it will feed it with employees. It will have uh, the quota for the Shia employees based on the Lebanese sectarian system that Amal will nominate them, while Hezbollah will remain the only military force in the country after the war. And the pretext is to keep fighting the Israelis until the liberation of uh, South Lebanon. And that allowed Iran and Syria to uh, agree on, that, on, on those terms. And Hezbollah leadership changed after that. Uh, and uh, that was the, the, the final uh, compromise. So George Hawi was himself a witness of all those things. And he had lots of information about all uh, those episodes of the civil war and of the assassination era, and then of the way the Syrians used to manage the uh, Lebanese political scene, because he dealt with them directly. He fought them in the early 70s, in the mid 70s, and then he allied with them uh, in other episodes of the war. And uh, he was himself once uh, in a meeting with Ghazi Kanaan, the Syrian uh, officer who was in charge of Lebanon, uh, with Elias Atallah uh, as well in that meeting, where Kanaan asked George Howey uh, to give him uh, regularly the program of the military operations against the Israeli before they are uh, carried before they are uh, before the attacks happen and uh, George Howe told him I cannot do that because we have given them the order to act whenever that is possible without even asking us or returning to to Beirut to uh, to to brief us about what they are going to do so you're asking me something impossible and at that moment uh, Ghazi Kanaan ended 
the meeting. And following that, there will be a series of assassinations of communists in the south. And even there will be, uh, on two different occasions, uh, clashes between the Syrian army uh, or Amal movement and communist groups who were returning after attacking the Israelis in the occupied uh, zone of South Lebanon. So uh, Howie was uh, an, an important witness in that. And uh, Samir was uh, a very brave voice against the Syrian regime. And to the contrary of many Lebanese who were opposed to the Syrian regime, he made lots of nuances and he was very clear about his opposition to the regime and not to the Syrian people and not to the Syrian intellectuals and that he was opposed to the Syrian regime also from a Syrian point of view and not only a Lebanese one and from a Palestinian point of view and not only a Lebanese one in the sense that the Syrian regime uh, was the enemy for Samir and for many people uh, among us of the Lebanese, the Syrian and the Palestinian peoples regardless of the discourses uh, that it used for its pro propaganda and for political consumption. And that nuance and that difference with the other uh, opponents of the Syrian regime in Lebanon uh, was crucial uh, and was part of the credibility that we wanted to uh, to build while distinguishing between Syrian laborers who were abused and who were exploited in Lebanon and the Syrian army and the Syrian regime. Uh, Samir read even one statement by Syrian intellectuals in the Martyr Square in Beirut in, in March 2005 and uh, he was insulted by many of the demonstrators who were there who didn't want to hear anything related to Syria and to the, and, uh, to the Syrians. Uh, and that, I think, position was very important. And Howie, uh, George Howie, after that, uh, and uh, on many occasions we met with him and the day when he was, assassin when he was assassinated on uh, June uh, 21st, if I'm not wrong, 2005, uh, we were going to have a meeting with him in order also to see how to consolidate a leftist uh, front uh, that would bring more communists who were not who were disappointed by the uh, official position of the uh, of their party uh, more former communists who left the party but remained in touch with Howie and that young democratic left movement that we represented and that was uh, receiving lots of uh, sympathy and having lots of solidarity after the assassination of Samir. So the assassination of Howe also killed that second attempt at enlarging the leftist front in Lebanon. And then unfortunately in the elections, we committed mistakes and we went uh, into the elections without uh, um, realizing uh, to which extent we might be dragged into the Lebanese uh, politics themselves and the way uh, they will run and the way the alliance will impose on uh, Elias Atallah, our deputy, uh, to be just part of the March 14 camp without really incarnating the leftist values that we want to, def to defend uh, after the withdrawal of the Syrian regime. And on that last part, can you talk a bit, uh, you had mentioned on the on the episode of the Beirut Banyan, which I will link on the, on the blog post, you had mentioned that the March 14 camp at the time, uh, the one yes. that the parties that were dominated actually preferred to deal with groups like Hezbollah and Amal than with uh, independent Shia voices for that matter, because that would mean that they would, if they if they dealt with independent Shia voices, then that would mean that they would have to also deal with independent Christian, Sunni and Druze voices. Exactly. Um, in fact, what happened is that uh, in May uh, 2005, and after the, uh, the withdrawal of the Syrians, and while preparing for the elections, uh, the heavyweights of the March 14, meaning Hariri and Jumblat, uh, but also the uh, Christian components of, uh, of the movement or of that alliance, uh, started to, to, to deal with politics exactly as, uh, as if the Syrians were still there, in the sense that you make deals, uh, you try to negotiate with other groups, just uh, any forms of alliance without respecting the uh, sacrifices and uh, the courage of many independent and small groups who def challenged Hezbollah among the Shia com community, inside the Shia community, I mean, and without uh, respecting the diversity of what 
could have been the March 15, 14 uh, front. Uh, once again, we did not have illusion about uh, their uh, non-interest in political reforms and in political changes. But we hoped at the time, at least, to uh, make it possible for people in South Lebanon, like Habib Sadiq, uh, for people like uh, Sayyid Muhammad Hassan Al-Amin, for people like Sayyid Hani Fahos, for many of the figures, whether intellectuals or even coming from religious backgrounds, but with uh, secular and open uh, uh, clearly secular uh, discourse and leftist discourse uh, to be represented and to be respected uh, regardless of their, let's say, size and clientelist networks within the Shia community. But for many of the March 14 leaders, it was much easier to deal with Hezbollah, to deal with Amal, with blocks, and with those who uh, are considered as representatives of, of the Shia community, exactly as they wanted Amal and Hezbollah to deal with them as the only representatives of the Sunni or of the Druze or of the Christian communities. Mm -hmm. So they, they preferred to have blocks sharing the quotas and sharing the lists and sharing power rather than uh, accepting, of course, to dialogue with Amal and Hezbollah. They do represent a reality in the country and a large part of the Lebanese and everyone had to deal with them, but to deal with them on clear stances based on principles and uh, without fearing uh, the uh, necessity and without avoiding uh, the uh, alliance with other voices uh, accepting a new electoral system that would allow those diversities to emerge. Because what happened in Lebanon under the Syrian regime and continued after the Syrian regime left is that more and more uh, blocs and parties and sometimes leaders were monopolizing the representations of their communities. And while doing that, any clash between them and any rivalry between them and the representatives of another community was leading to clash between communities, making the confessional system itself working uh, even uh, more of efficiently, uh, efficiently, of course, between brackets, in bringing people against each other or turning people against each other whenever their representatives that are more and more imposing themselves and monopolizing the representations of the community were uh, clashing with each other on questions that were not always political. There might be about uh, uh, who will put whom in which position, uh, what kind of project will be implemented in which area, who will take that contract and who will obtain uh, that uh, privilege in, in, in getting a commission for another project. And we saw it later with many of the crises, whether related to the electricity, uh, to the garbage, to many other crises, it was about sharing the administration, the economy, uh, and uh, most leaders in Lebanon, whether from March 14 or from uh, March 8, prefer that on dealing with political reforms, on dealing with groups that might be minorities in their communities, but they do have their own representative legitimacy. And of course, uh, without a proportional system in the elections, having those people was impossible. So finally, in, in 2005, uh, May 14, uh, sorry, March 14, preferred to sacrifice uh, many of those who worked with the opposition to the Syrian regime in order to make a deal with Amal and Hezbollah and to share power uh, again. Their argument was uh, to avoid civil strife, to avoid conflicts, while in reality, even if avoiding conflict if, is, of course, demanded and is a priority, it was much more about their own mentality, clientelist and sectarian mentality, and not something else. And this would happen again and again and again, even after 2005, whenever there is a broadly independent alternative, like the, I guess the most well-known case in recent years is Beirut Medinity, you would have the entirety of the establishment basically uh, going against them. Absolutely. This is a, a typical, in fact, they, uh, they can accuse each other of of uh, uh, having loyalty to Iran, uh, to Saudi Arabia. Uh, they accuse e each other of being uh, pro-Western, pro-Syrian uh, uh, regime. Until the elections happen, they will, in many cases, they will be in confrontations, but they finally make governments together make the decisions together, share the power and uh, share the quota within the administration. And whenever they are uh, in a mood of reconciliation and harmony, 
uh, you have more corruption and you have more deals and you have uh, much more agreements on most of the questions uh, that will uh, lead, in fact, to uh, to uh, spending money uh, in, in different ways and uh, without regulations and without control. And each time there is a group or a force that is trying to uh, emerge and to create uh, a new language in politics and new practices and a new culture, uh, they will all be allied against it because they consider that it will threaten them regardless of, uh, uh, I mean, in which region and, and how. And they, they are all obsessed with this idea of change un, un, unless the change is targeting only one group or or one camp. So Hezbollah mm-hmm. would not mind having uh, a new experience if it will only target Hariri and Jaja or Jumblat, let's say. Uh, and they might also, in, in reciprocity, will not have a problem if there is one group that will only target uh, Hezbollah uh, for, for different reasons. However, if they consider when the elections will happen that this will not be useful, they will once again sacrifice and uh, try to find a deal or a contract. And this is related to the nature and to the characteristics of the consociational system in Lebanon, uh, the way it has evolved and developed since the civil war and since the rise first of the Christian right wing with Bashir Jmail and the whole idea of unifying the militias and unifying the Christian uh, ranks. It continued with Amal and Hezbollah in the Shia community. Then Hariri brought it uh, through the economy and through his uh, uh, networks of relations, Hariri father, to the Sunni community. And since that time, you have monopoles. Of course, Jumblat is uh, also the heavyweight in the Druze community. You have those uh, representatives who uh, have been sharing power uh, since the Ta'if Accord until today. And uh, if you look at all of them, uh, they were all in the civil war, except for, uh, I mean, Hariri, uh, now Sa'ad was not in the civil war, but uh, uh, Birri was in the civil war, Hezbollah was in the civil war, Jumblat in the civil war, Jaja in the civil war, Aoun in the civil war, the Jumayel in the civil war, uh, I mean Jumayel, not his son. So uh, all of them were part of the civil war, and then some were excluded in the post-war by the Syrian regime for some time. They returned after, uh, and it has been the same political elite. Uh, Changing it is uh, not an easy task. Uh, Confronting it is, of course, not easy neither. But uh, uh, at any moment, there are attempts at doing something. We see that directly or indirectly, uh, they will have ways of uh, containing that and and being opposed to it. And now with the current situation, uh, Hezbollah is leading the uh, counter-revolution or the counter-attack, and uh, it has consolidated the government and and weakened uh, dramatically the the uh, revolutionary uh, I mean uh, at- momentum and attempts at, at modifying things and supporting you you mentioned it but I'll just expand it a bit for those who don't know that the names that we're talking of are names that uh, most of them either come from the 70s and the 80s some of them come from the early 90s so Walid Jumblat and Nabi Hibere, all of those are from the late 70s uh, has bought Nasrallah from the late 80s early 90s the Jmeirs, if not them themselves, but their entire clan, the family of Jmeirs, those go back to like the 30s and the 40s. You, uh, um, Michel Aoun from the 80s, Samir Jaja also from the 80s. These are names that are have basically, uh, Elias Khoury was interviewed by Megaphone like two years ago, and he described the current regime as a civil war regime. At the end of the day, yeah. they are not fighting each other anymore in the same, in the sense they're killing each other. They, there was a brief moment where this could have erupted again in 2008, of course, the, the, the May conflict of 2008. But by and large, they seem to have uh, kind of, as, as we call it, a power sharing agreement of tolerating each other. They don't like each other. None of them, even the, each other's allies, like uh, the Free Patriotic Movement or the Aouniye and the Amal Movement are notoriously antagonistic towards one another. But they agree to form this alliance with one another because at the end of the day, it's easier to deal with one another than it is to deal with any kind of s- serious alternative, however that alternative uh, can look like. I wanted to switch a bit to Syria because one mm. of the uh, one of the reasons I wanted to talk to you is that you're actually one of the few Lebanese, and as a Lebanese, this frustrates me very, very much. That uh, thinks as well about Syria and that actually engages with Syrian civil society, and in your case, you've even written books on that. There is a quote by by Samir Asir, which which is extraordinary uh, when when one reads it today because I think he wrote like only two months before he was killed. Uh, Mm. which is uh, when the Arab Spring blooms in Beirut, it announces the time of roses in Damascus. And 
this is a code that was just a few months ago redrawn and it's the it's for people who want to know it's my cover photo on twitter was redrawn as a graffiti on in idlib yes. uh, which is one of the most difficult places to be right now in syria and uh, with Samir Asir's uh, name and uh, someone uh, he calls himself uh, the Syrian Banksy. And it shows that there is a legacy uh, with this Lebanese, of, of course, of part Syrian and Palestinian intellectual. But he was very active in Lebanon, first and foremost, when he came back from Paris. The legacy that he has among Syrians is something that we don't often see among uh, Lebanese, as far as I'm aware, no? Yes, you are right. Absolutely. In fact, in Lebanon, uh, uh, there is a tendency among majority uh, not to evoke Syria, either out of fear uh, or because this is a divisive issue. Uh, some people uh, among the Aounists and Hezbollah and Amal movement support the Syrian regime. Uh, some others uh, would prefer not to be uh, uh, categorized or considered in one camp or the other. And some, of course, are opposed to the Syrian regime. But as I said, either out of fear or uh, they do not consider that it's any more their, their priority. So unfortunately, in Lebanon, uh, yes, there is this tendency at avoiding uh, the Syrian issue, uh, even though we have uh, around a million refugees in the country. Uh, added to, to, to the 2, uh, 250,000 Palestinian refugees and to tens of thousands of Iraqi and Sudanese and other refugees. Uh, while Lebanon is not uh, a country that signed the 1951 uh, agreement on refugees, so they are not legally refugees. Uh, they are considered just guests or, or uh, people who are there. Uh, UNHCR is dealing with them. And uh, there are lots of laws and legislations and lots of practices full of racism and discrimination against them. This has been the case of the Palestinians. It's now the case of the Syrians and all the others. This is very unfortunate. Uh, but there are also many Lebanese who kept, I mean, supporting the Syrian uh, revolution and the Syrian civil society, uh, regardless of the balance of power and regardless of uh, the the tragic development of the events, in, uh, of the, of the uh, war and uh, of the balance of power again in Syria. And so... We had uh, something called the, the Damascus Spring in 2000. Yes. It was very small. It was limited to intellectuals, but it kind of was part of this, um, like we can call it planting the seeds in a sense for, for what, was, what was to come later. But when Samir wrote this specifically, it's, let's, let's use this metaphor. A spring had happened in Beirut, the Cedar Revolution, yeah. the Beirut Spring. Yeah. Then just only six years later, Obviously, we had the widespread uprisings throughout the region, including the Syrian revolution. And since then, so that's now, uh, well, nine years. Yes. We've, we've seen ups and downs throughout the region, a lot of disasters, a lot of horror stories, especially in Syria, of course. And in October of uh, just uh, six, seven months ago, we've had another uprising in Lebanon, which uh, for my generation was really the first of, of its kind. We've, we did have the 2015 uh, you stink movement. I was involved in that as well, but there's really yeah. nothing that compares to our generation to what has been happening, what has started happening in October 2019. How would you like as a reflection, how would you interpret that quote and how would you reflect on the links between Lebanon and Syria, which, as you said, are not talked about as much as they should in, in Lebanon? As a small anecdote, just to link it to mm. the, the present, mm. I recently co-wrote an essay on uh, Jumhuria, Syrian Jumhuria, not the other one, yeah. uh, <laughs> uh, with a Syrian friend who had to write under a pseudonym for, for, for uh, security reasons. She, she couldn't obviously use her real name. Yeah. And as someone who, uh, she's based in Beirut, and she was participating in the protest with us, and then at some point she felt that she couldn't because it was becoming a bit too uh, too much for someone who's visibly Syrian. So when she talks, she has a visibly Syrian accent, let's say. Um, and in, in Beirut itself, in uh, Riyadh al-Salah especially, in the, the, because there is this weird dynamic for those who don't know, where you have in Beirut Martyr Square, uh, kind of the general population, maybe centrist liberals and others. And then on Riyadh al-Salah Square, you have the communists and the, the, mm. the more secular oriented, and then you kind of like more politicized, let's say, a segment. So I would be with the latter. And you might see some Palestinian flags sometimes and everything, but imp utterly impossible to find any kind of Syrian opposition flag, Kurdish flag for that matter, like we don't even think about it. And there is a genuine fear among Syrian anti-Assad Syrians who are in Beirut, those I know personally and others, 
that mm. if they are mm. too visible or if they try to link up what's happening in Lebanon with the 2011 uprisings, for example, not to mention everything that has happened since, that there won't be a, a reception for it, that uh, at the very least, there will be some complications ahead of them. And of course, they could they just couldn't take that risk because they didn't even know if there were people among us, among the protesters, as it was the case, of course, in the beginning, that weren't necessarily uh, anti-Hezbollah or any, in the beginning, especially in the first few weeks. Yeah. There yep. was a mix of everyone. We had the Lebanese forces, Hezbollah, everyone was with us among the seculars and the communists and the leftists and so on. So how would you reflect on these contradictions, of course, uh, 15 years on after the coat itself and, of course, after the assassination? Mm. Um, the coat came uh, in a moment uh, where uh, in Lebanon we were more and more convinced that as long as the Syrian regime exists, it will be extremely difficult uh, to have... Uh, a sovereign and uh, a secure and a peaceful Lebanon because uh, the whole ideology of the Syrian regime as developed by Hafez al-Assad was related to controlling uh, Lebanon on the one hand and to trying to control the Palestinian question on the other in order to make regional and Middle Eastern politics uh, what will give the Syrian regime itself its own legitimacy and uh, the reason of its existence uh, because uh, Assad did everything Assad father once again did everything to erase the Syrian uh, society, uh, not to allow it to appear, uh, to bomb it if necessary, and to use the regional uh, policies and, and politics and Syria's position as a way of getting legitimacy while negotiating with the Americans, uh, with France, with the Soviet Union and with Arab actors, especially the Gulf actors, uh, being at the same time an ally of Saudi Arabia and the only ally of Iran offering himself as a possible mediator with Iran, being uh, an ally of the Soviet Union, and then also communicating and coordinating regularly with the Americans. And then finally, uh, while the Soviet Union was collapsing, sending his own army to fight under the American leadership against Iraq. So Assad used Lebanon as a place where he could bargain, where he could negotiate. And controlling Lebanon was an obsession. Uh, and assassinating anyone who could threaten that control happened on many occasions in Beirut, in Tripoli, in different places. So uh, the idea of connecting Lebanon to Syria in that sense was uh, a, a kind of realistic uh, acceptance of how politics function in between the two countries under the Assad regime. And Samir already published in 2004 a book that gathered many of his articles in An-Nahar. The book was entitled the independence of Lebanon and the freedom of Syria, considering that Istiqlal uh, Lebanon wa Hurriyat Syria, or the independence and the freedom in, in, in the two countries, are uh, interdependent, are very much uh, uh, connected. There is an interdependence between the two questions. And the whole uh, relation and friendship with many of the Syrian dissidents, whether outside Syria or opponents and former political uh, prisoners inside Syria, was part of the 1998 2000 uh, experience in the cultural supplement of Anahar, and then after 2000 during the uh, Damascus Spring there were lots of uh, uh, connections and friendships that were uh, built uh, and that tendency continued until 2005 when Samir wrote uh, that article in which he considered that uh, the Syrian withdrawal from Lebanon will weaken the Syrian regime in Syria and hopefully will allow for uh, a change in Syria Syria itself, uh, after Syria loses the most important scene for it, uh, when, when you talk about Syria here, of course, I mean the regime, uh, that is Lebanon. Uh, and uh, of course, uh, one can uh, analyze the reasons of Arab revolutions uh, that might not be related or inspired by, by the Lebanese 2005 event. And that's, in my opinion, there was no influence of what happened in 2005 in Lebanon on what will happen in Tunisia or Egypt or even later in Syria. Uh, we're talking about even if it's only six years, but the context is different and the dynamics are very different, even if uh, the, uh, the pictures and the images of the crowds uh, just 
defying fear and and challenging the authorities they they do uh, create some similarities and allow us a few comparisons but there were different reasons however what you just said about the 2019 uh, uprising in Lebanon after the 2015 uh, former uprising that was related to the uh, uh, garbage uh, crisis uh, definitely here we have a second moment of Arab revolutions because in Lebanon as well as in Sudan in Iraq and in Algeria millions of people went to the street again uh, and went to the, to the streets knowing that what happened in 2011 in Tunisia Egypt Yemen Bahrain Libya and Syria was not always uh, a success story. Uh, there were lots of uh, sufferings after that. There were counter revolutions. There were defeats. There were terrible wars with interventions, as in Yemen and in Libya. Uh, there was, uh, uh, I mean, all sorts of, of uh, disasters in Syria. Not only the uh, Assad regime's barbaric repression and and uh, uh, crimes against humanity that were committed, uh, but also the Russian uh, occupation now with Iranian intervention. Uh, ISIS or Daesh, uh, then the Americans, uh, the Turks, everyone got involved in that terrible uh, conflict and in the wrong way in most cases. And the country today is fragmented and uh, more than half of its population is either refugees or or internally displaced. So I think there was an awareness among the new generations in Lebanon, Iraq, uh, Algeria and Sudan uh, to avoid some of the failures of the 2011 first important wave of Arab revolutions. And if in Lebanon some were part of the March 14th or of the 2005, let's say, uh, political moment with its uh, huge mobilizations, the reasons in 2019 were really different. Uh, and uh, uh, what I can say is that in 2005, uh, we were at the time, our uh, dream and our hope and what we were trying to work for was to have something similar to what happened in 2019, just immediately after the withdrawal of the Syrian regime. And we did write many articles in that sense. Uh, in fact, uh, one other quote that is always used that Samir uh, wrote in 2005, which is or uh, return to the streets. Uh, and uh, many of the articles that uh, I published in Anahar and many others published as well, we're about the necessity now of moving from the independent uh, intifada, as we call it, to the uh, reform and change uh, intifada, uh, and to bring some ideas. Uh, I did summarize many of them in a book that was called uh, Rabia Beirut wa Dawla Naqisa, published in 2006, The Spring of Beirut and the uh, uh, Unachieved uh, state uh, with some ideas of reforms. And then I published a small booklet called Antakuna uh, Yasarian fi Lubnan, being a leftist in Lebanon with some ideas also for reforms. And But unfortunately, all, all that uh, and all what many others uh, did uh, from different positions and, and different backgrounds uh, was digested by the Lebanese confessional system, by the uh, leading political elite and, and by the political class. And we we, we failed in a way in modifying the balance of power, uh, not only the assassinations, but also some of the mistakes that we committed, uh, some of the maybe, uh, uh, I don't want to say illusions, but we probably underestimated also uh, the strength of the system itself. It was not naive uh, at the time to underestimate, not at all, uh, because there was um, one million people in the street, and many of those people were not really fan of the whole political class. Some some were, of course, there were blocks that were mobilized by this political class and remain loyal to it. But there was also uh, what we called the citizen poll or the citizen camp within uh, that 14 March, uh, that was uh, unfortunately was lost uh, because we did not build something that could have gathered all those who were secular, who wanted reforms after the withdrawal of the Syrian regime. We got dispersed and, and we, we did not build the, the momentum uh, and we lost the opportunity. After that, it was a bit late uh, due to the assassinations, but also uh, due to the new uh, cleavage in the country uh, that uh, did uh, drag us all and it was a kind of uh, of a, a situation of a dilemma in which you cannot withdraw 
when uh, assassinations continue uh, and you cannot approve at the same time what your uh, supposedly allies were doing and your uh, comrades are doing. So you feel trapped between criticizing them and at the same time uh, keeping uh, uh, your position very clear and sharp against those who were committing the assassination, meaning the Syrian regime and uh, its allies in Lebanon. So that situation was very difficult and continued uh, that way until at least 2009, uh, because after 2009, in my opinion, there was nothing any more uh, meaningful in in talking about March 14. Saad al-Hariri was forced, forced by the Saudis to go to Syria. Jumblat followed him. They reconciled with Hezbollah and formed uh, a government that he led. And things kept like this, ups and downs, until 2019. In some moments, they uh, they have uh, severe disputes and Hezbollah uh, orchestrate a coup and remove Hariri. Then there are mediations and agreements and Hariri returns. And they shared the governments, they shared the administrations, they all voted for the budgets, for the financial policy uh, that led us to the current disaster. Uh, Aoun was part of it and his bloc can never uh, pretend that they were not. So it was a completely different dynamic that finally led to to 2019 uprising. I saw a video of you from uh, July 2011, which I will also link, in which you spoke about the uh, silence, the deafening silence, as we we just mentioned, of of Lebanese society and activists vis-a-vis what's happening in Syria. And that was in the early days of the the revolution, when it was still mostly peaceful Mm. and nonviolent. Not peaceful in the sense of the, the regime was still cracking down, but the revolution itself was not armed as much yet. Yes. By the time, by the time I personally started paying attention, which was around 2012, 2013, also the the same hesitation would happen, and then since then, um, I remember a bit in 2015, a bit in 2016, then a bit in 2018. You might have some a uh, small movement among Lebanese civil society when it comes to Syria. There was even a small protest that I attended. I think it was around the fall of Alep. No, it was around the fall of Eastern Ruta some a couple of years ago. Yeah. Um, where you have uh, some people talking and everything, but all always a, sm- a small group. More recently, uh, as as I said, this has not been resolved in the sense that uh, the Syrian friend I mentioned will still feel threatened, will still feel unsafe to be over. Like just say I'm here as a Syrian in the same way that some Palestinians might be able to say I'm here as a Palestinian. But even with Palestinians, I should emphasize there's all, also a lot of risks that they can do if they are too visibly Palestinian, so to speak. Sure, but sure. The, I, I'm not, I'm not going to re-ask the question of how have you seen the Lebanese response to the same situation because you've already answered this. But I wonder if we can talk a bit about the right now when we talk. So right now when we speak about the Lebanese government, what we mean in effect is essentially Hezbollah, uh, the Free Patriotic Movement and Amal. Those are the, the three big blocks. And then you have the yes. other blocks allying themselves in a sort of opportunistic way, however it it uh, pleases them. But We've also seen a much more open, at least since the the big, big clash of 2008, that which was really an exception to the rule because Hezbollah up until then, up until 2018, usually did not openly uh, target other Lebanese, at least not since the civil war. Though it was part of its, um, it was part of, of, of the myth of Hezbollah that we are only here to mm. uh, fight Israel, this is our role, etc., etc. But since October, I mean, putting aside 2008, which I said was quite, was quite yes. uh, the exception in a sense. But since in October, I was personally uh, beaten up by Hezbollah people. You had Amal and Hezbollah openly saying that they are with Amal yes. and Hezbollah with, with flags, with tattoos, with like very, very visibly partisan and sectarian, beating up protesters, uh, torching tents, not just in Beirut, but especially in Nabatiye, in sure. in Sur, uh, in other places. But we've also seen, which for me is the extraordinary bit, people, for the most part, sometimes the, the fear would be a bit too great and so it would take a bit more time. But people after these events, sometimes just like an hour or two hours after the event, going back down on the streets, rebuilding the tents and uh, maintaining an anti-sectarian Chant. And that's important because in 2008, Absolutely. as we know, the, the fights were sectarian. The fights were between the two camps. One, essentially one was Shia and the other one was Sunni and Druze and some Christians in between or whatever. But yeah. since then, we, there is a, an open resistance to the idea that anything can be solved through sectarianism. So I wonder if you, as someone who especially witnessed 2005, and then I know that you, would, you still visit Lebanon quite a lot since then, how would you um, interpret... 
uh, let's let's use it in a vague way. How would you interpret the post October moment, and what do you think are some of its potentials and maybe even some of its risks? Well, exactly as you said, when it comes to Hezbollah, there is a myth about Hezbollah not being involved in uh, internal Lebanese uh, uh, fights or clashes. Uh, other than Hezbollah was part of the civil war after uh, it was created in 1983, uh, so there were still seven years of civil war in which Hezbollah was involved, uh, either between uh, the two Beiruts or against the communists or against Amal or against uh, some uh, other groups in uh, the Beka, etc. Uh, in the aftermath of the war, yes, it's true that uh, from 19, uh, 1991 until 2005, uh, Hezbollah was much more uh, either into the uh, resistance against the Israelis uh, or into uh, having a low profile in Lebanese politics uh, simply because Iran and Syria were managing the Lebanese political scene in a way that protected the party and allowed it to be uh, consolidating itself uh, uh, as a grassroots, not only as, as a political and military organization, uh, but with all kinds of social institutions, hospitals, schools, uh, dispensaries, uh, uh, charity networks, uh, scouts, uh, uh, cultural institutions, media, uh, newspapers. So Hezbollah was not concerned about the macro uh, politics and was getting more and more uh, involved in managing municipalities, in having uh, a large bloc with its allies in the parliament, and of keeping Amal movement, managing the government, not being directly involved. After 2005, what changed is that while Syria or the Syrian regime was expelled from Lebanon, Hezbollah started to act inside Lebanon as if it was replacing the Syrian regime. Uh, in 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 the sense that they were not only now involved in the government directly, uh, not only in the parliament and on the uh, local level in the municipalities, but they have also controlled uh, what can be considered as the foreign policy and the security situation in the country, exactly as the Syrian regime was doing. And whenever Hariri or the other camp was threatening that control, uh, you can talk when it comes to the security about Fir al Malumat that Hezbollah opposed because it was not under its own control. Uh, whenever the foreign minister was not directly from the Amal movement or a Aounist, uh, where they will try as well uh, to see when it comes to the ambassadors, who's who, what kind of position will be taken. And when, uh, when in 2008 Hezbollah could not control the situation as it wished, uh, because of, uh, at the time, its clash with Hariri and Jumblat and, and the other camp, they invaded Beirut and by force. Uh, they uh, took over the government, Senyura had to resign, and uh, new negotiations happened in, in Qatar, uh, with France also being a mediator, starting a new page or a new phase in, in that uh, history of relations between Hezbollah and its uh, uh, rivals on the Lebanese scene. Uh, then you have in 2011, when Arab revolutions started, and when there were some talks about a possible uprising in Syria, Hezbollah also uh, did not invade this time uh, uh, Beirut, but uh, did deploy thousands of young men in black shirts to send a message that we are ready to take over. And that led later to the uh, resignation of Hariri when Jumblat uh, changed or shifted a bit uh, his camp uh, out of fear from Hezbollah's uh, uh, objectives. And uh, that moment uh, led to Hezbollah taking over. But due to the confessional system, they have to bring a prime minister who's Sunni, so Mi'ati was brought, etc., etc. Uh, you, you have a permanently uh, moments where Hezbollah uh, does attack and imposes itself. And that's what happened again now uh, when mm -hmm. there was a threat with the new revolution, with the uprising of uh, October 2019. Uh, Hezbollah did orchestrate uh, the whole situation by uh, taking over, uh, and the government today is controlled by Hezbollah, as well as its uh, foreign uh, policy. Now, what changed, however, is that we have a new generation, not only the old people or the less young, let's say, who are uh, still involved uh, in, the, uh, uh, in the uprising, uh, but a new generation, they were not concerned politically in 2005. Let's say they were uh, born in 2000 or in uh, 98, etc. They were not concerned with 
the cleavages, uh, the divisions of 2005. Many of them were born also, or at least became mature politically after the end of the Syrian era or during the Syrian revolution. So for them, Syrian control of Lebanon is an old, uh, is old history. Uh, they had other dynamics. They are part of also, th- their consciousness is much more related to uh, human rights and social justice and not anymore into uh, pro or against uh, the Syrian regime. Of course, some of them, and you know them uh, quite well, uh, were pro-Syrian revolution. And in many of their slogans, they saluted all Arab revolutions, including the Syrian one. But many maybe were uh, considering that they are doing their own uprising, their own revolution, and they didn't want to be trapped by uh, any kind of classification, whether they are pro or against uh, the Syrian revolution. Uh, But I think that whenever they are into the human rights and the social justice and the freedom uh, kind of terminology and discourse, they cannot be opposed to the aspirations of other people around them, whether they announce that or not, uh, for similar uh, causes, uh, whether in Syria or in any of the other places that witnessed Arab uprisings. So what what changed today is that they are not anymore concerned with March 14 versus March 8. Uh, They are not uh, obsessed by uh, Syria in Lebanon, the Syrian regime in Lebanon, as we were the generation of the uh, 80s and 90s, and they have a new uh, discourse, they have uh, new ideas, Uh, they are about personal freedoms as well and personal choices, Uh, taboos in the past in a way. Uh, There is a dose of feminism that is important, uh, as I saw it at least in the demonstrations and in the slogans. Uh, They are uh, much more creative uh, now with social media allowing them as well to express all that uh, through their videos, their documentation, uh, their initiatives, their uh, slogans, uh, the sense of humor. Uh, There is something that uh, developed after 2011 that we can also find it here. Uh, However, what is missing, so the potential for a change is there. There are definitely leaders that are emerging and will continue to emerge. We're talking about uh, just a few months of uh, uprising, uh, uh, including uh, uh, two months or so of corona and of uh, 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 lockdown, etc. What is missing, however, is uh, coordination uh, is, uh, I don't want to say like uh, leadership in the sense that you have a a camp with a a porte-parole or with spokesman, woman, no, no, but something that would coordinate uh, and would keep the diversity and would keep uh, the leftists and uh, the independent and the liberals and those who just want uh, to get rid of corruption with those who want more things when it comes to uh, a feminist approach, when it comes to social justice, to racist against foreign laborers and, and refugees. We, we can have all of those together, including even some part of the bourgeoisie uh, that are opposed to corruption. Those diversity, uh, this diversity uh, uh, should be tolerated and is useful. Uh, However, something that could find what is common and keep what is different for each to to struggle for it and to fight for it peacefully. But uh, to have a coordination that will put all energies, all all, uh, efforts together in order to modify the balance of power that is today, once again, because of violence, that Hezbollah directly deployed through its ally Amal movement and some of its members, and since it formed the new government through the security forces and the army that are now under the order of a government that is itself under the order of Hezbollah. So they don't need to send their uh, their militants or their members to attack uh, people in Kfar Rumen or in Nabatiye or in Sur or in Beirut. Uh, now the army and the security forces uh, can differently, of course, uh, but can impose curfews, can uh, request to dismantle tents, and they did dismantle some of it, uh, some of them themselves, uh, can attack demonstrators who are trying to be on the ring uh, street, uh, uh, blocking the access to car. I mean, they can now use the repressive measures of the state institutions uh, in order to impose once again, their uh, order and and their control and to make any change uh, extremely difficult. Uh, However, there are still 
uh, resilience so far. And we saw that recently many demonstrations took place uh, that sit-ins are once again organized. We saw in Tripoli uh, a mixture of uh, uh, anger because of and frustration because of poverty uh, and, and because of the terrible financial and economic crisis that was even made worse with the corona. Uh, and the political, uh, once again, uh, desire to, to change things and to confront the political uh, ruling class. So uh, it's an ongoing process. It will have ups and downs. It will continue. I don't see that it will uh, die uh, or it will be defeated uh, uh, soon. Uh, but let's also agree that it's extremely difficult and that Hezbollah does hold to power uh, with its allies and uh, they do have uh, their own uh, power and they do have as well the power of the state institutions of the army uh, and uh, they might be helped indirectly by by creating a new dilemma related to the world bank sorry to the uh, uh, IMF mm -hmm. uh, and and to the collapse of the banking uh, system uh, with all the billions of of, of of losses for all host households and for the the majority of the of the Lebanese who will be confronted with more and more challenges in the uh, in the future. I was I have a final question about Samir Ossi, but I wanted to yes. um, kind of squeeze in a parenthesis in a sense. We mm. um, briefly mentioned him and he was mentioned in the past, but I only want to talk about him now because he was recently re-voted as an MP. But can you talk a bit about the role of someone like Jamil Sayed and and the, 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 the entire structure, let's say, of the security forces and of Amn al-Am at the time and in the because I know that there was even a personal antagonism between Jamil Sayed, as you said, yeah. and Samir Osir. And since then, because you, as you mentioned, Hezbollah sort of took over the role of the Syrian regime in some ways yeah. it's even stronger than the Syrian regime was at some point. Sure. And since then, you have people who were even in prison, like Jamil Sayed, who were uh, seen as almost like persona non grata, like we won't see them for a while, now resurfacing and almost feeling more comfortable about themselves and even being comfortable enough to run for elections and win one. Yes. Uh... In fact, between 1998, when Emile Lahoud uh, became the president of the Republic, something changed uh, in the uh, internal structure of, of the Lebanese state. Under Hariri father, the control of Hariri uh, was uh, very strong and... Um, he managed to, to have deals with the Syrian regime, like keep me working, doing my uh, economic uh, and, and uh, other stuff, and I will let you, uh, due to the regional, international uh, uh, compromises and accords, you will manage the rest through your relations directly with the Lebanese uh, security apparatus. So Hariri was much more into an economic uh, role. And then from time to time, due to his international connections and to his Arab connections, uh, he was allowed or he played a role uh, in, uh, I mean, in, in agreement with Hafs al-Assad uh, to represent uh, both Lebanon and Syria in, in some connections and some relations. And that formula that Hariri found with the Syrian regime functioned for a while. When Bashar came to power, it was the end. Bashar wanted to uh, impose himself on everything, in a way, and didn't trust Hariri. Uh, so he started bringing his people, and among them was Emil Lahoud. He became president. Hariri had to uh, withdraw at the time. He was not anymore uh, prime minister. He became in the opposition. And this is the moment where the role of Jamil Sayyid, along with the role of uh, uh, the one who will replace gradually Ghazi Kinaan, uh, Rustam Ghazali and the aide of Rustam Ghazali, Jamia Jamia, uh, another officer, by the way, can, all of sorry, them were... Can you say, yeah, can you say who the, these men are, the last ones? Uh, uh, Rustam Ghazali became uh, the uh, uh, Syrian uh, officer managing the Lebanese uh, uh, the Lebanese, uh, Lebanese affairs, exactly as Ghazi Kinaan, who was also a general, uh, did before. Uh, Ghazi Kinaan, officially, he committed suicide in late 2005 in his office. Uh, while there are, of course, uh, information and rumors about himself being uh, assassinated or eliminated by uh, the Syrian regime after the assassination of Hariri because of what he represented and because of the information he had, Rustam Ghazali replaced him. And then Rustam Ghazali himself was killed in Syria in 2014. Jamia Jamia 
2015 uh, after being beaten badly in 2014 uh, Jamia Jamia was number two after Rustum Ghazali in Lebanon he was killed in Der Zur uh, and both of them Jamia Jamia and Rustum Ghazali their names came on in many reports uh, when it comes to the assassination of Hariri and their presumed role in that uh, assassination so it, it was as if the Syrian regime kept cleaning its own ranks from those who were directly involved and who could lead uh, to the top of the hierarchy in, in the accusation. Um, anyway, they became, uh, with Jamil Sayyid, more and more powerful in the absence of Hariri father, and Jamil Sayyid became, in a way, the architect of the political uh, system at the time. He was a security man, so he had lots of information, uh, many files in his hands, uh, and uh, he started to play political roles that are related to political mediations, uh, to elections, uh, to uh, journalists. He had lots of uh, connections within the media uh, in, in outlets in Lebanon. And he appeared as a very strong man uh, in the country. And this did not really change after Hariri returned to power in 2000 and until his assassination in 2005. Jamil Sayyid remained uh, crucial in the political system. Uh, whether against or sometimes in uh, uh, in understanding, let's say, with, with Hariri, he remained one important uh, person. And this is when uh, his uh, relation with, uh, uh, his conflictual relation with Samir appeared. Samir criticized him directly on many occasions, uh, wrote uh, articles about the role of uh, security apparatus in, uh, in the Lebanese uh, politics. Uh, his passport was confiscated, as I mentioned. And then uh, there were uh, two people working for the Sûreté Générale of Jamil Sayyid, following him uh, regularly whenever, wherever he, he went, just to keep pressure on him. So in 2005, after the assassination of Hariri, uh, many believed that Sayyid himself, with the Syrian officers and with some other Lebanese officers, were connected to the assassination. And that's why he was uh, arrested. Now, uh, legally, he was arrested... Uh, in a controversial manner mm -hmm. uh, because uh, he was just accused and not yet condemned or there was no uh, proofs about the whole thing uh, when he was uh, arrested. But Melis, the international investigator who, who arrested him, considered that he has the right to arrest those who might threaten his own investigation for some time. Mm -hmm. And due to a Lebanese law that was passed under Amil Lahoud, uh, and some people say it was passed uh, under the guidance of Jamil Sayed himself, that uh, period of arrest that should expire, and if you do not prove uh, that the person that you arrested is really guilty, you should uh, liberate him, that law was amended, allowing to keep renewing the arrest uh, until uh, you decide whether it's not necessary anymore. So Melis used that with the, with the Lebanese investigation group, used that pretext to keep Jamil Sayed and the other officers in jail. And that, of course, created among some people sympathy with them. Among some others, there was no sympathy at all. Uh, the opposite is, is quite the, the, the case. And finally, I think it was in 2009, uh, Jamil Sayed was uh, liberated by the new investigator who said that I don't have enough proofs to keep him in jail. And since that time, uh, he tried to appear as if he was the martyr uh, as if he was, uh, uh, his rights were violated, uh, that he was a political prisoner, that it was out of revenge, political revenge, that he was put in jail. In jail, and uh, he uh, became a deputy in uh, the last elections. Uh, plus, many consider that he's very ambitious and he wants to be the speaker of the parliament, and that is creating lots of tensions with Nabih Birri, uh, and uh, Birri's people uh, uh, keep uh, criticizing Sayyid, and he responded uh, regularly also criticizing their corruption. Uh, and in the current government, many of the ministers, in fact, are uh, considered to be very close to Sayyid himself. So he was a kind of a minister's maker uh, in the current government in alliance with Hezbollah. Uh, his role is definitely important uh, uh, today. Um, when it comes to Samir's assassination, th there were no clear proofs uh, leading at, uh, at Jamil Sayyid to be very clear about it, at least mm -hmm. to my knowledge. 
to my knowledge. Uh, but definitely the hostility between uh, uh, the hostility that he had towards Samir, uh, the pressure and the threats that he did against Samir uh, were obvious and were were official in a way that he, he didn't even hide them or or uh, uh, deny them. And he spoke about them uh, in front of many journalists uh, uh, who repeated what he used to say uh, and uh, repeated uh, and, and explained at what extent he used to hate Samir and to uh, uh, to to wish to I mean put more pressure on him if possible. It's extraordinary, and I, I will. So this will be my my final question, which is linked on this, because at the end of the day, Samir was a writer. Like that that was the main thing he did. Even though like obviously yes. he he was then more politically involved as a spokesperson for for the for the movement and so on, of course. But fundamentally, what he did the vast majority of his time was write. He wrote a book on the history of Beirut. He he. Uh, Wrote, as you mentioned, the book on the first part of the civil war between 75 and 82 and so on and so forth. Yes. And of course, the as part of uh, Lorient Express and the Nahar and so on and so forth. But so maybe this can be uh, like a wrapping up this entire conversation. And thank you a lot for, for the time you've spent on this. Can we talk a bit about the symbolism of having or retalk? Because I know we mentioned this a bit, but kind of like emphasize it a bit even more. Samir being uh, part Palestinian and part Syrian. He was Mm. able to tie the Palestinian cause with the Syrian cause. And at the same time, he was able to tie the Syrian cause with the Lebanese cause and the Palestinian cause with the Syrian cause, uh, sorry, the Lebanese cause, and so on and so forth. Uh, Today, we see the only major uh, sectarian political party in Lebanon, Hezbollah, uh, being basically the only party that even pretends, quote unquote, to care about Palestinians. It pays lip service to the cause. Of course, that doesn't include the Palestinians in Syria, obviously. Even as I said, like, uh, even as it kills Syrians and, and, and Palestinian Syrians on behalf of, uh, basically one of, like, Hezbollah takes credit for liberating Lebanon from one of its occupiers, and now it's allied with the other occupier. Mm. And Samir was killed before Hezbollah really showed its strength, which was 2008, and then obviously everything since then. Uh, it was even before the 2006 war, and uh, as we said before, everything else. Why did it, uh, as far as your... Um, why did it matter, according to you, so much for him personally and politically to link the Palestinian cause to the Syrian cause and to the Lebanese cause? And why does it still matter uh, today? Now, uh, for the first part of the uh, of the question, uh, Samir being himself uh, Lebanese, but also Syrian and Palestinian, uh, being within the Lebanese context from a Christian family, and leftist and secular uh, was something that I think uh, had lots of impact on his own uh, uh, political profile and political culture and on his evolution. Uh, Paris did change Samir a lot when it comes to understanding what the Syrian regime is about through the Syrian dissidents who were living in France and the intellectuals that he he met and to understand as as well uh, how, uh, how important was the Palestinian propaganda in the Syrian regime's discourse to the regime itself and to the legitimacy that it was uh, trying to to uh, to build among Arab nationalists and leftists who are not uh, from uh, the Levant or from Lebanon, Syria, Palestine, uh, that we can until today see in a way supporting the Syrian regime against the majority of its people in, in the Maghreb and in Egypt and in other places. Uh, for Samir, in that sense, the uh, being Palestinian is by itself a reason uh, for being opposed to the Syrian regime, exactly as being Syrian uh, opposed to the Syrian regime, exactly as being Lebanese opposed to the Syrian regime. In Lebanon, we suffer uh, the regime's hegemony and military occupation. Uh, In Palestine, we suffer a despotic regime and a brutal, barbaric regime using Palestine as a pretext uh, to uh, repress its own people and to impose itself in Lebanon and in regional politics. Uh, in and Syria, in Syria. No, no, I mean, even for, for uh, the Palestinians, they oh, sorry, are used, yes, yes. in a way, they are used as if for their sake, the Syrian regime does everything else. 
uh, among that everything else is repressing its own people and occupying Lebanon and brutalizing uh, the PLO and the Palestinian camps in Lebanon and not only in Syria. And of course, for, for the Syrians, it's the uh, worst thing that can happen to be under that regime, uh, under the father for 30 years, three decades, and now uh, already 19 years under the son, so uh, almost half a century. Mm -hmm. uh, so for him, connecting the Lebanese independence and sovereignty, that would mean the withdrawal of the Syrian regime, to the Palestinian identity that should uh, uh, liberate the Palestinian struggle from all those that use it as a pretext to impose themselves elsewhere and to uh, to repress their people and to impose all kind of measures against their own people is important. And as a Syrian with his also friendship with Syrian intellectuals uh, uh, and with, with especially Farouk and Omar Amir Alai and with many others, uh, is to support the Syrian struggle against that regime. So this uh, connectivity between the three causes for him was important. And since he was um, very much concerned with an Arab Renaissance project, Project, uh, that he wrote about in his uh, book, small book, uh, uh, though important, uh, uh, Consideration sur un malheur arabe. I think it was translated in English to being Arab. Uh, he considered himself as well as part of those Arab intellectuals who should continue the discourse of the Nahda, of the Renaissance, of uh, talking about uh, uh, f freedom, empowerment, emancipation of man and woman, about secularism, about social justice, about, and that's what he said in the book, that our problem is not in our history, it was much more in our geography, so we should understand that and consider that we have all the potential uh, to bring the Renaissance uh, on track again, and at the same time, we should not keep a victimization uh, discourse when it comes to the West without denying that in the West... Uh, there is uh, sometimes imperialist projects, uh, domination projects, Islamophobia, uh, etc., etc. So he wanted to find a kind of a synthesis that will put together uh, many ideas and, and many uh, uh, principles related to his Arab identity uh, within the Lebanese context, the Syrian and the Palestinian, uh, but also within a kind of Mediterranean or universal uh, world uh, uh, of connections and of cultural uh, exchange and influence and uh, uh, metissage or all kind of uh, uh, relations that could, could exist in a healthy manner with the rest of the world. Uh, so that's why uh, for him the liberation of Palestine or, or a Palestinian state, uh, the struggle for it should be connected to the struggle against all despotism, specifically the despotisms that use Palestine uh, as a pretext to justify their practices. And as a Lebanese, of course, uh, liberating Lebanon from both Israel and the Syrian regime uh, was uh, one important question. Now, for, for Hezbollah, uh, it's true that uh, Hezbollah in Lebanon pretends to always be uh, uh, defending uh, Palestine and celebrating the Jerusalem Day and mm -hmm. preparing for the liberation of Palestine after the liberation of Lebanon, as uh, uh, the Secretary General of Hezbollah himself, Hassan Nasrallah, uh, repeats each year. Uh, but let's not remember, let's not forget, sorry, that even before uh, getting involved in Syria uh, on uh, in support of the regime, uh, that uh, killed not only Syrians but also Palestinians in Syria, in Yarmouk and in other places, Hezbollah never evoked in Lebanon the question of the Palestinian social and civil rights. Uh, we have refugees in Lebanon that uh, have been there since 1949. They were at the beginning in uh, 15 or 16 camps. They are still today in 12 camps. Um, some of the camps were devastated by the war and by the massacres. Uh, some others are still there and they become even more crowded now with the arrival of Syrian, Palestinian Syrian, I mean, refugees. Uh, and all those Palestinians are not allowed to work in 77 jobs in Lebanon, in 77 fields, which leave almost nothing for them. They are not allowed to uh, have property. They cannot move easily from one place to the other. Uh, there is a kind of uh, embargo or a kind of uh, uh, sieges that are around their own camps. Uh, and never ever Hezbollah uh, did uh, present a legislation 
uh, in the parliament asking to modify those discriminatory laws. Uh, the Hezbollah's uh, perfect allies since 2005 and since 2006 officially the Aounist or the uh, Patriotic Free Movement is probably the most racist movement against the Palestinians before even the Syrian refugees. Uh, they uh, keep talking about them as if they are going to take our country and uh, those refugees. Lebanon cannot deal with them. Uh, they uh, say that we are proud of being racist mm -hmm. and all their measures against the Palestinians. Hezbollah have ne has never uh, just even condemned uh, Jubran Basile's statements that are, uh, if, you, if you use them in, in Europe, uh, you might be attacked, I mean, in, in justice by SOS racism and by many uh, different groups. Uh, Hezbollah's allies are uh, racist against the Palestinians. The Syrian regime uh, massacred the Palestinians, not only in Syria, but even in Lebanon during the civil war, uh, not only the PLO in 76, but even Sabra and Shatila and Burj al Barajni in 85, 86, 87, during the camps war between the Amal movement, the Syrian ally and the Palestinians. Uh, most Hezbollah's allies, as I said, are racist against the Palestinians. And uh, uh, this reminds me of what some uh, Palestinian and Lebanese friends used to say, that there are uh, many groups and uh, regimes in the region uh, that love Palestine and hate the Palestinians. Uh, I'm, I'm, I'm not saying that Hezbollah is exactly in that configuration, but I mean when it comes to the Palestinians themselves, nothing has been done in Lebanon to make their life more decent. And in Syria, Hezbollah has intervened to support a regime that was massacring them. Does this deny that Hezbollah fought Israel with lots of efficiency uh, in South Lebanon? Of course not. Hezbollah did fight Israel uh, and, and contributed to the liberation of South Lebanon and performed very well in the 2006 uh, war with the Israelis. However, this does not give it any right to intervene in Syria and to contribute to the massacre of the Syrian people. It does not give it any right to impose its own will on all Lebanese, including those that disapprove the party when it comes to its policies and its regional alliance. And I'm not talking about its fight of Israel, but its alliance with Iran, because many do consider today that Hezbollah uh, does implement Iranian policies, and uh, we are not supposed to uh, uh, accept that implementation uh, when it comes to our own uh, sovereignty, or even if we forget the term sovereignty, uh, to our own interests as a Lebanese nation or as a Lebanese society, uh, or as a Syrian also nation and society, since the Iranian policy imposed itself in Syria as well. So the problem with Hezbollah in that sense, and I tried to uh, summarize it uh, yesterday in, in an article, that there is no solution with this party, and we are uh, also, we cannot reach any solution without the party. And that's our uh, dilemma today. It's such a strong party internally and regionally now because of Iran. Uh, and it has in front of it, when it comes to the sectarian groups, such mediocre uh, opponents, mm -hmm. uh, uh, allowing it to uh, control the situation in the country. So you cannot change things as long as it controls the situation because it's powerful and it will not allow that to happen easily. And at the same time, you cannot have a long-term solution if Hezbollah and if the, the uh, popular basis of Hezbollah is not part of the solution. And we have been confronted to that now for at least 15 years, uh, and we continue to be confronted, uh, maybe because of the system, that is confessional, that is sectarian, maybe because of the uh, Iranian rise as, as a regional power, uh, maybe because of uh, the, the Israeli threat that pushes lots of people in South Lebanon to remain loyal to the party. Uh, so this is a, a severe and, and serious challenge that we have to deal with in Lebanon, avoiding at the same time uh, any possible, uh, not civil war, but I mean clashes and, and, and violence, uh, but without also uh, just surrendering and accepting uh, Hezbollah's will and the way it wants to impose Iranian regional interests and uh, uh, internal uh, power arrogance on all Lebanese, making the reforms and the change impossible and uh, preserving a system 
that even if uh, some of its uh, heavyweights are not part of it today, remains very much corrupt and very much responsible of the series of crises that we have uh, been living through for decades. And just if you allow me one final question that is uh, related to what I uh, do believe is a key issue in the whole region, uh, and that is also connected or related to Samir's assassination, that is impunity. Uh, the, the Middle East, the Arab world, uh, and Lebanon have been going through impunities for now uh, at least a century, if, if not more. Uh, you have one state that is Israel that was created in, in 47 and imposed itself in 48 that has been violating international law, uh, Geneva Conventions, United Nations resolutions, and it has not been sanctioned uh, by any international or by any powerful government until today. Uh, and that impunity that uh, allowed Israel to impose its violations and its uh, will by, by force and by occupation and by apartheid and by uh, settlement did give lots of arguments and justifications to many Arab regimes to do exactly the same against their own societies and sometimes even to use more violence and more barbaric acts against their own societies. And we see it today in Syria. We saw it before in Iraq. We, we saw it in Libya. Uh, we, we see it today in Yemen. Uh, in many places, those regimes also benefited from this same question of impunity because there were always deals with them, compromises, stability versus freedom, uh, avoiding the rise of political Islam and accepting all kinds of abusers, uh, avoiding refugees and political opponents who might leave, and etc. So uh, impunity, and we see it, of course, now in, in Syria, we have been seeing it since 2011 in a, in a terrible manner, all kind of uh, massacres, chemical weapons, torture, rape, uh, abusers, uh, and still, until today, there are vetoes protecting the Syrian regime as there were vetoes protecting Israel. Uh, there is no international tribunal when it comes to the uh, Syrian case because of different, uh, I mean, legal questions, not only political ones. Uh, but it's still, it's a key, this question of impunity. And when it comes to assassinations, it's the same. Samir's killers are still uh, uh, if, if, not, if not killed in, in Syria, they are still running free anyway. Uh, killed in Syria, I mean, uh, after 2011 or uh, in internal eliminations to get rid of all those who might be proofs of the Syrian regime involvement and its Lebanese allies. So uh, uh, this question of, of impunity that goes from individual assassination to uh, mass murder uh, and, and even uh, genocidal uh, kind of crimes to occupation and settlement and apartheid regimes in our region is the poison uh, that kept poisoning our lives for, for decades. And uh, I think it should remain or it should become one priority in all political agendas, uh, not because we believe in international justice, this is not the issue, but in a, a certain form of justice that should be built and imposed uh, with, with uh, international alliances, with international networks of jurists, of militants, of uh, uh, academics, of uh, political fighters, etc., etc. So I think this is an extremely important uh, question. Uh, otherwise, uh, it might continue and we might have other assassinations and not only other repressive regimes and, and occupation, etc. I guess the conclusion will be that impunity leads to impunity and there has to be accountability, which I Absolutely. think uh, protesters in Lebanon would definitely agree with, as well as protesters everywhere in the world. And on, on that note, uh, Ziad, thank you a lot for your time. You were very, very generous with your time. And uh, yeah, continue what you're doing. And thanks again. Thank you very much. I, I enjoyed it and I hope uh, it was useful. Absolutely. Thank you.